Hey guys, welcome to this milestone episode of the Frontier Talk podcast. I'm Raj Hegde and in this podcast we explore the intersection of identity, people and technology. My guest on the pod today is someone who I look up to and is known to fuel the fire of optimism in people. It is this combination of positive energy, expertise and a bias towards action that makes him a serial winner. From serving as CTO at Sun Microsystems to co-founding Forge Rock, an identity behemoth that was recently acquired for billions, my guest has truly been a frontier in shaping identity as we know it today. Here to share his take on the metaverse, company building and the future of identity, Lasse Andreessen, the founder and CEO of Indikite. Lasse, delighted to have you on board. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'll, I'll pay you afterwards for those nice words. That's, that's fantastic. What 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 a day! What a way to start the uh, conversation. Well, it's it's your work that uh, that really showcases um, you know all that you've done, and uh, it's just a testament of of what you've achieved. So it's 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 absolutely an honor to have you on the podcast. Uh, with that being said, uh, let's roll. I'd like to start off by 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 deep diving into the evolution of um, identity. Uh, you know, it is said that you can predict the future of any given technology by studying its past. Uh, the internet, for example, has progressed from say being read only to read and write, and now with Web three being read, write, and own. So, how would you describe the evolution of the identity ecosystem since the inception of the internet? Wow, and then. And as you know, I, I've been part of that journey, and so much kind of like happened over the two last last decades. And right. I, I kind of and one thing that uh, kind of you saw in in the back in the the old days was, of course, it was very human centric, and it was very static, and it was very simple. Kind of like uh, you you were belonging to kind of like a sales department, and you got access to the, these few kind of like applications, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, and not a big kind of like dynamic, no context, and it was very only human was kind of like the synonym of it, identity, but. Wow! Now, kind of like everything is connected, and everything has an identity. And there's there's more things kind of like out there with an identity. There's more bots out there. There's more APIs, and of course that is and like makes a lot of opportunities, but all a lot of challenges as well. How does how do you secure it? How do you, do they authenticate? How do you scale this thing? So now, Ed, this is absolutely a space which never gets boring. Right. Uh, you mentioned bots earlier on, uh, and you know we're seeing a proliferation of bots, uh, be it on the internet or on social media platforms. With research from Carnegie Mellon stating that roughly around twenty percent of all social media conversations involve some sort of bot involvement. Now, this is somewhat worrisome because many of these accounts somewhat spread disinformation and also make a point of view more popular than it already is. So, my question to you is. What are the implications of malicious bot activity on society? Yeah, because this is a very kind of like serious stuff and, and really tricky. And you know, also kind of like in, in the beginning on the internet, kind of like it, as you said, it, it was read only, and you didn't need mm -hmm. to kind of like had a lot of kind of like identity in. As soon as kind of you start transferring money and actually getting uh, generating value on on the internet, you actually need to know who who's actually paying, who's actually t transferring money. And the same thing will also happen with bots because if if you speak to a magic, magical bot and say kind of like I have a headache today, what should I do? And they say you should cut off your kind of like left arm. That's a really really bad advice. And who's accountable right. for, for all this stuff? So these bots need to be accountable uh, for uh, and somebody is actually the owner and somebody has actually uh, created these bots. And of course uh, the. <coughs> um, Facts and uh, 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 be able to prove facts also kind of like uh, then you need to know who they are. I'm all for freedom of speech, but, mm -hmm. but for Christ's sake, if you uh, want to say something, you should also be able to identify you and, and do no harm. And there's too much bullying going on already on the internet. So yeah, I, identity play a really really fundamental part of making things safer and also better and, and even more fun. Right. And speaking about identity and IAM per se, do you think uh, present IAM solutions have kept up with the speed with which 
software is being developed uh, what do you think are the implications of a lack of catching up with with the development of software i think there are absolutely a big gap uh, on on the needs kind of like you, you mentioned how many bots is is kind of like online how many you know, kind of like internet of things is out there what mm-hmm. you see still is that things are extremely fragmented and there are historical kind of like systems out there and people are still struggling so right. I, I don't I and of course now with the metaverse you have a total new kind of like dimension that you you need to secure and identify and I think uh, we really need to start using new technologies and, and leverage AI machine learning knowledge graph and, and go, get away from this static way of, of looking on um, on identity the the identity systems you actually reflect the real life and you know what we we are have different contexts every day so at work i'm i'm kind of like the founder at home i am a father and mm-hmm. and depending on what context you are in you want to have um, different kind of like abilities uh, and also be securely kind of like protected in a different way so yeah there's lots of stuff to do and that's that, that's why it's so fun to be in in this um, in this industry right um you know i i really look forward to to deep diving more into the new ways of of doing identity with with as you mentioned you know knowledge graphs and relationship based access management but before that i just like to 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 look at what changes uh, do you expect uh, for the identity market when it comes to managing non-human identities such as iot's or smart devices which you just mentioned earlier on i think first of all kind of like it and ot needs to kind of like cooperate and there needs to be mm-hmm. a bridge this has normally been uh, in two very different silos and and on kind of like ot still kind of like a little bit like uh, kind of like identity used to be but protected by a firewall it's kind right. of like that, that that everything now is 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 zero trust and they and there are there are connection and humans are kind of like uh, interacting with a lot of devices and and things all the time and very often also uh things actions or processes are started without actually the human being actually doing it so mm-hmm. there's a big change uh in in the way the use cases um start and the whole processes and uh, this the the kind of legacy vendors are still very very human centric and think everything about from like a process start with a human but that's not only that's not the case very often right uh, i think now is a good time to explore your new baby indikai <laughs> yes i'm i'm really curious to understand what indikai is all about what led you to found indikai in the first place and and what do you think is is the the special moat that i would say defines um your organization per se first of all i think when on the, the first part of your question kind of like what led me to start indikite mm-hmm. was exactly the same thing that kind of like uh, led me to start forgework right passion passion that's everything which is is driving me and i i'm kind of like uh, our people ask me kind of like um, what keeps you at wake at night like mm-hmm. it's kind of a hint thing to that I'm worried about something I'm not I have hope okay. I'm I fear of missing out so uh, right. what drives me is passion and passion and and I I'm born curious and then uh, and actually getting putting a putting a great team together go out there and um, and kind of like create fantastic technology and in my old days I used to do um, play a lot of bands so i started a lot of bands and i see a right. lot of the kind of like similarities you need to find great great band members you need to kind mm-hmm. of like get them to um, to communicate you need you need you need to help them to actually create a hit song and when they go on stage and the audience go fucking wild uh, sorry mm-hmm. for my french uh, it's all good <laughs> it's the same with with creating great technology companies you need to get right. the best of the best to, to uh, together there's a lot of diversity which is great and you go out there and you disrupt and uh, so we w- <coughs> so again uh, but forge work was started with that fa- um, that passion and mm-hmm. indicate the same thing and the good thing with with starting a new company is that everything is greenfield 
There's no right. te technical debt. You can go mm -hmm. and you can pick the latest or the greatest of technology which is available today. You can make an architecture with without kind of like constraints that yet you had 10 years ago. So that is is a big big plus uh, doing a doing a new company and um, a lot of things has uh, evolved uh, of course in in this space so um, that that makes indicate very very interesting and we probably should drill a little bit down what we're doing differently i think absolutely absolutely i think that's uh, well the passion is clearly seen in in the way you <laughs> describe uh indicate and i'm sure you're off to the races with it uh could you talk us through uh what makes Indikite special from a technical point of view? Are you doing things differently uh, from what traditional vendors are doing? Uh, what is your USP when it comes to building Indikite? Yeah, I, uh, there's a couple of things, of course. First of all, I'm really, really um, committed to the design principles on, on Web3. Kind of like the, the whole way of thinking decentralized um, um, at the start. That's mm -hmm. key to what, what uh, everything we do, making sure that, that kind of like the information uh, actually is owned by the owner of the information uh, and kind of like you know, people can people or businesses organization can share what they want to share when they want to share it with their consent. Uh, right. So that so so that giving giving power back to the owner of, of, of the data. Uh, mm -hmm. The, <clears throat> the other thing I think is the, the keyword here is actually data. Because you think okay. about it, when you, when you have a lot of identity data, you know kind of like um, people's preferences, uh, what they like, you know, where, they, mm -hmm. where they live, what kind of car they have. Uh, that's a lot of good knowledge. And why don't you use it for much more than does security to say yes or no? Mm -hmm. You can do really, really starting use identity data to um, to drive recommendations, analytics, uh, and hyper personalization. And of course, everybody knows Netflix and Amazon, kind of like how you get these recommendations. And mm -hmm. behind the scenes, it's an identity system. They just capture what films did you see and connect that to your identity. So when you come back, you get get recommendations. So I think identity is. First of all, it, it used to be kind of like a liability problem uh, mm -hmm. for, for enterprises and it was handled by kind of like the security people only. Right. Now, what you see, the same identity data is an insane business asset because you can make so much fantastic services on top of it. You can grow your top line revenue, you can get more customer loyalty and it's the same. As long as you treat, look on what the data is, and you make them actionable, um, yeah, you can use all these information, of course, to be secure, but you can also make uh, use it to actually make make better services uh, for your your customers, your um, your citizens, whatever. So, stop thinking about identity system system only from a security level. Start thinking about it from a business value. Uh, you know, the more we know about each other, the better we mm -hmm. can serve each other. And as long as it's on, on, um, on, on, on in, in my choice, which again comes, comes back to the privacy part. So I, I see the tremendous opportunities here with new technology. Brilliant. So you heard it first on the Frontier Talk podcast. Uh, <laughs> you know, stop viewing identity as just a security paradigm. Uh, go above and beyond and view it as a potential business asset. Now, so, uh, yeah, please, please, Lasse, go on. Yeah, and security, of course, it, it's a table stake and it, it's necessary mm -hmm. to actually build something on top. So uh, kind of like in, so everybody knows that there's more kind of like cyber security threat than ever. There's more hacking and mm -hmm. there's more malicious things going on. So of course you need to, to, to kind of like still raise the bar on, on the plumbing. Mm -hmm. But but also look the other way on the other side of the coin, the utility side of the coin. Knowing all, having all that information, it can also be used for something good. And I think there's to be too little kind of like focus on the good and too much people are just going to say, if you don't do this, you're not compliant, you go to jail. 
right. that's fine, but also use it for, for something good and, and build business and better services. Right. I mean, that that reminds me of this point made by Andre Kavalech, who will be speaking at CSLS, uh, mm. the cybersecurity conference in Berlin. Uh, and he mentioned that cybersecurity in a nutshell is very, very hard to do because you're essentially facing a very dynamic opponent. Oh, yeah. So my question is, you know, when it comes to IAM, do they even have the time to look at applications beyond security? Because as you mentioned, they're dealing with this on on a much more regular, sophisticated basis that perhaps they don't have the time or resources to point their attention to other applications of identity. How do you navigate through this dilemma? I don't think it's a dilemma. Uh, I think this is actually w exactly what IndyCAD is doing and what our technology is doing. Be mm -hmm. Because kind of like, if you build everything up on, on a knowledge graph and you start building kind of like identity digital twins uh, of your profile of of all the things all the bots all the the cars the the locations and this mm -hmm. is all connected in the, in the big graph uh, there's no difference if you query the graph and ask for a fine-grained authorization decision or a recommendation it's just what you ask it for uh, so i can ask the knowledge graph is this person allowed to do this uh, or I can ask what you, th uh, what have all the the other person with a similar profile actually done um, when they um, they watch the movie or or whatever. And uh, I'm in the car and I in, in in Japan and I I don't speak Japanese. I don't read Japanese. And having a rental car where your whole kind of like info info system in the car is Japanese. I can't even get it started uh, or getting the music on or putting on the map. But if if you have identity data, knowing that I'm a Norwegian, and as soon as I get mm -hmm. in the car, the, the car system uh, kind of like know that there's a Norwegian guy sitting there and you just switch the infotainment system to Norwegian. Just by in-depth context, there's a Norwegian mm -hmm. in, in the front seat and not a German guy. So it's just, and the rental car next time is uh, in a different context, somebody else is in there. So things are very right. dynamic and based on mm -hmm. context, you need to have different decisions. But it's all is driven by identity data. It's just uh, metadata, identity data, which you can actually in real time uh, pick up a query uh, where it today resides. I don't believe in synchronization. I mm -hmm. don't believe in big data lakes. You always got to be never, never have the, the kind of like the, the famous single source of truth. Oh my God. Yeah. The, yeah. Many people have tried, uh, and they try to synchronize stuff and copying stuff around and, uh, mm -hmm. kind of like instantly they were, they had two different kind of a like copy of the database and it was not a copy anymore because the update ha had already happened. So it's, so right. we need to just leave the data where it is. There's mm -hmm. so many APIs. There's so many different systems that need to interact. And I think today the most important thing, we need to build bridges between these systems moving from the web two to the web three, because uh, there's gonna be a lot of systems already. Google is not gonna disappear tomorrow mm -hmm. and the banking system will not. Uh, Right. So when we are building up new SSI networks, uh, these for a very long time need to interact with the old world. And I think mm -hmm. be able to bridge this and just go where the data is, and understanding the data mm -hmm. in real time and understanding the context, that gets it really, really powerful, both from a security perspective, but also from a business perspective. Right. And that was a fascinating insight there, Lasse. I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on the decentralized identity ecosystem in a nutshell. You know, uh, there, is a deep there is a deep dysfunction rather in institutions managing our data as you clearly articulated. Uh, what do you think are some of the top priorities for anyone looking to build decentralized identity solutions? First of all, the lack of interoperability. Uh, okay. and, uh, and also, you know, kind of like I'm, I'm hundred percent kind of like behind uh, the whole all the privacy uh, thing, mm -hmm. but but for so long people have only been kind of like uh, out there with kind of like oh bad 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 Facebook, yeah. mm -hmm. 
And you know what? Um, I don't think it moves the needle if you only go out there and kind of like uh, with this kind of like danger flag. We need mm -hmm. to kind of like uh, use all these fantastic new technology blockchain for instance when when you when you need it for actually do create use cases that actually changes stuff and not go out there and, and only talk about about bad things so getting use cases that actually uh, people uh, value and take advantage of get them fast out try mm -hmm. to um, we have to make a lot of bridges and we need to have um, kind of like more standardization for interoperability is in, in now it's even more kind of like broken than it used to be yeah. as you know we we spent I don't know how many years do we do we spend before we had standardized kind of like OIDC uh, mm -hmm. and it, it was great when we, everybody got there and the same things need to happen in um, in the web3 world uh, we can't have ev like a lot of companies making their own version and uh, having their own protocols. Um, there needs to be interoperability, there needs to be standards, and it also needs to be bridges to existing systems uh, that already exist. They, they will hang around for a while. There are still mainframes out there, you know. Right. I mean, just as uh, Harry Behrens, our guest on the first episode, mentioned that identity is a means and not an end. Yeah. Uh, the the point about privacy really hits a chord with me because, uh, you know, I'm curious to understand how can organizations in the space move beyond privacy to actually articulate um, the case for decentralized identity uh, beyond, say, privacy. How do they create competitive differentiation and and you've raised uh, venture funding from you know some of the finest investors out there so so what's required to make decentralized identity a serious venture case I think first of all uh, any case where you can kind of like actually show value really really mm -hmm. fast and help kind of like growing the top line revenue for for a company Right. Uh, will, will always go faster than the opposite. You, I, I, uh, I normally say this: people only buy for two reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. That could be a, could be a customer or a venture capitalist, is greed or fear. Uh, that's the only two that are things that actually moves moves the the needle. Okay. And and it, there's no doubt about it that kind of like use cases that are actually are on the happy side, uh, making new better services make more money, uh, customer retention, all that stuff in a secure way, those projects and use cases will move much, much faster than the other one that say, if you don't do this, you go to jail. Uh, right, okay. That doesn't mean you, you, you should stop, uh, don't think about that side of it, mm -hmm. but, but uh, you can do both things at the same time because it's, it's the same identity data. And if mm -hmm. you qu query for, uh, asking for somebody is allowed to do this or a query it for kind of like what do you think Lasse would like for dinner today? It's, it's mm -hmm. just a different question to the same data. Right. Brilliant. I think now is a good time to check out the cool stuff. Uh, <laughs> let's explore the metaverse. Uh, it's, it's a term that is gaining more and more prominence over time. However, there are three schools of thought when it comes to the metaverse. You have on one side the gaming side of things, on the other hand, you have Meta, Microsoft with their AR, VR point of view. And then finally, we have Web3 with the more decentralized point of view when it comes to the metaverse. So which school of thought do you subscribe to? And what do you think is the metaverse? Where are we actually heading with this? <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, I'm absolutely in, in camp number three. And uh, okay. unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm not a big gamer uh, mm -hmm. but, th but that's just kind of like uh, my personal kind of thing and uh, and, and of course the uh, I like the real world better than actually I like the virtual world uh, it's right. kind of like uh, again using my music background being at the live concert and actually mm -hmm. kind of like both feel it and the, the bass is kind of like pumping in, in your chest and I, I get right. goosebumps just thinking about the live concerts. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And I think that live thing is much more interesting than kind of like uh, showing a concert with avatars jumping around. But of course, right, right. The, the, the good stuff is that we, we are all different. So I think there's a mm -hmm. place for, for, uh, for both of uh, this world. I, I see a lot of the, again, the whole VR thing has been, been a holy grail and been promised for a very, very long time. That is and, true. And and still have some time to go. I, mm -hmm. Where I see it moves mostly now is is actually in kind of like education and training, where you kind of like okay. have, a, have kind of like a, a walk through through a through a hospital before is before is actually is 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 built. So you can test if is this wall actually on the right place, or you um, or you are actually having security um, kind of like. Um, uh, what do you call it? Education programs, how to how to behave and where should you find the exit, so you don't have to physically be have to be in the location. So I see a right. lot of a lot of educational thing is now starting to. Um, so you see more approach. of an enter uh, you see more of an enterprise take to to VR rather than consumer. Is that yeah? I, I think uh, I, for VR I see that, but of course the like entertainment movies. Uh, is always also is, is a big kind of like vertical that they're gonna have have um, make 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 a lot of money. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't think the other one of them is not gonna kill the other one. Again, there, there right. is we, we we are humans and we all have different kind of like uh, things that we like and what we don't like. So, That's true. Right, but I, and but again, yeah. from a, if you look on the metaverse thing, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of um, or which kind of like school you go with, mm -hmm. you need you need identity because if you're going to monetize something, who <laughs> how are you going to be able to authenticate who's actually going into the metaverse? What you do in the metaverse? So there's still got to be need for identity here, um, which is of course every thing you put online that has a value will need identity. Right, and how do you see this identity? paradigm evolve assuming say we take a giant leap into the metaverse is say my online representation restricted to only physical characteristics or can we go beyond this of course we can um, and uh, that could probably uh, absolutely be fun specifically uh, on a saturday night like like today mm -hmm. i'm just kidding yeah. uh, <laughs> so uh, no but I, I but i also i think um Back to the digital twin, and, and also a little bit back to security. Uh, I think uh, security risk and and kind of like you know, not you know we have all these programs for educating people to don't click on that link or don't do that or, mm -hmm. or whatever. I think we need to come to a place where you, where I have my little identity or digital twin on my device that first of all knows me. But also learn really, really fast, uh, and uh, on what threats is out there. What is is the newest scam that has just been identified, and right. kind of like helps me, uh, and I even tell me don't click on that link or prevents me to doing it. I think technology will make decisions faster than human brains or training programs. So having uh, my my good digital twin that actually uh, know who I am, know what I. Sh uh, what I like uh, can be very, very helpful. And, and that's not s so hard to do. That's really kind of like near future. Right. And how big a role is AI going to play in this ecosystem? Do you see room for machine learning, AI to build yeah. more uh, there, there's still like, real relationships yeah, in the metaverse? There's st still a lot of challenges, of course, and also mm -hmm. ethical challenges. That is true. But, uh, but it's kind of fun. I don't think machine learning is something that is sitting on the side, if you know what I mean. You know, mm -hmm. when you are developing software, you, you, you have an IDE. So you have a kind of like uh, a development environment You're using some tooling. I, mm -hmm. I think actually machine learning is just, just to be a natural thing to have in your, your toolbox that you apply to where, where it actually fits. And nothing, right. nothing that is an afterthought or something that's going on in in the basement, it, it's actually okay. part part of software development as mm. as we go go forward. I don't see 
any software being developed without using machine learning techniques going forward. It, it is just 2023. That's how we do it. <laughs> we we use that technology for uh, for making things easier. Right. Uh, let's shift gears now and focus on on company building. Uh, you know, from our conversations, I see you as someone who lives a fun, flamboyant, and fast life. <laughs> And flamboyant? these are traits that I flamboyant. I'd say, why not? I mean, <laughs> with interests such as speedboarding and rock or, music, I mean, you're up for course. the races. I mean, come on, absolutely. <laughs> so, so I'm curious to learn uh, what are some of the learnings from your hobbies that have, say, percolated into your working career. And it's absolutely the music stuff. Uh, okay, that, that no doubt about it. Uh, and I. There's so many similarities, kind of like being uh, starting a band, starting a company, or kind of like be a manager for for a company, or, or trying to to managing a band. And I think I have so many samples to that. But I so, some of them is kind of like I sometimes have people in my team and coming coming and complaining about a developer that this. This guy or this girl, she's kind of like she's so out there. Just kind of like the, the, right. she don't <laughs> don't follow any rule. Uh, there's no way I can lead this person. And yeah. then I say, yeah. and uh, then I say, you know what? Uh, do you think it was easy to be kind of like the manager for Keith Richard? Probably mm -hmm. not. But guess what? They they one of the biggest rock band in in the history. So so, so just deal with it and. Without that diversity on stage, uh, mm -hmm. actually the music would be really, really boring. And, and, uh, and that, that is every, every band. So that's why you need these different type of, of, of people coming together. The trick is, is actually to have people collaborating and listen to each other in a band mm -hmm. or in a company. Uh, I don't know if you played music, but uh, if the drummer and the bassist don't communicate mm -hmm. and they're offbeat, it doesn't get groovy. I can't promise you. <laughs> and right. the, the same thing is in in business, kind of like if engineering or product management or sales, mm -hmm. and they they are not communicating, it will, will not, not be a great yeah. company. So, uh, and actually getting uh, so it, it's all about getting the best group of diverse, strange people. Find them where they are. Let them, let them, uh, of course, um, grow. Get them mm -hmm. out of bed on stage. Create a hit mm -hmm. song and and perform together. And uh, that's kind of like what creates a hit song and the the crowd gets crazy. It's also in, in the software industry uh, when you have that same thing going on. That's when mm -hmm. it's catching people actually buy your software. So it's, right. it, it's very similar. Wow. Okay. I'd like to run a little thought experiment with you. So, uh, you know, imagine you're you're starting from scratch, and you know you have a penchant for doing legendary things, and that's cool. But my question to you is, how do you get or attract this world class team from the ground up? So, how do you find them? How do you get them to be attracted to your idea, to your proposition? And then, how do you get them together to riff and eventually create like a monster hit? That's three questions, not one. That's true. I mean, I like to package <laughs> a lot of questions <laughs> into one. That's good. That's so a just good forgive, observation. Yeah. Uh, just, just, just forgive me if, if if I forget to answer the last one. It's but, all good. No worries. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. But uh, but kind of like I think on the first one, it, yeah. it's it's basically, I I'm born curious. Uh, yeah. If you know what I mean. So Absolutely. I. I, I don't read kind of like a lot of books from kind of like from page one to page 360. Uh, mm -hmm. But I read a lot of snippets and very often um, when I start in the morning and I see, see something and that actually leads to another link to another thread to another thread, I can just kind of like go on this mental mental trip and, and follow that on. And then, right. <clears throat> and then you, and then you f there's so much interesting things going on. Um, and I think the other thing is that uh, there's uh, I, I I don't I'm not afraid of asking. So mm -hmm. if, if I find an interesting article or an interesting stuff on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I kind of like, I just go and say, do you have time for a coffee? Uh, right. And the worst thing that can happen is um, that they don't they re- say no. reply. Yeah, or they don't reply. Yeah. <laughs> they, they either say yes or they don't reply. So that's, okay. that's easy. That's much easier, uh, actually. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, specifically kind of like, uh, I've been, as you know, spend a lot of time in, in the Bay Area, and there's a very mm-hmm. open culture for, mm-hmm. yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a coffee. I don't know who this strange guy is. But, uh, yeah, he happens to be the co-founder of Forge Rock, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is recently acquired for billions. I would be stupid to miss out on coffee with him. Yeah, absolutely. Well, whatever. <laughs> um, the uh, f- no, it's, so it's uh, and yeah, sometimes it's actually both expensive bad coffee and, <laughs> yeah. and, and thirty yeah. minutes of your life you never get back. But right. but very often uh, it it leads to kind of like the next interesting thing. Uh, so the uh, so that, that's uh, kind of like uh, I think how I find people uh, mm-hmm. and the uh, and I think the <coughs> how 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 do I trick them to join me? I don't. Was mm-hmm. that your next question? <laughs> that was actually you're you're doing very well. I mean, go ahead. Uh, yeah, keep I, in think, track. I, I yeah. think that is my blue eyes. Um, is it? No, oh, <laughs> just kidding. I mean, I know quite a few people who have blue eyes, but. Uh, <laughs> They're still finding their way, so... <laughs> no, yeah. I, you know, honestly, I am, and thank God, uh, we, we are kind of like that. We are very, very different. I, I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure that there are a lot of people that never would to follow me even to, to go on a bus trip, if you know what I mean. Right. Uh, we, we all have different different passions. Uh, Absolutely. Fortwalk uh, had a very kind of like great culture um, and, and peop- people that likes that excitement and that type mm-hmm. of culture and uh, they start talking about uh, this and they 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 talk to their friends and you find uh, fun other people that likes likes the same something I when you see your uh, your um, team members actually are using kind of like the, the t-shirt with a logo right on, uh, when they are actually off work, then you then mm-hmm. that's a good sign that they actually you're doing something work right. There. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. When you have a logo and you you turn your T-shirt around, <laughs> the you, other you, way around, yeah, that's, that's you not know, a good. You, you don't want to <laughs> see uh, say I'm, I'm working at Oracle. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, that's uh, that's a different story. So yeah. it, it has to be people that are kind of like attracted to to the to the to the same thing. And again, back to music. Uh, Kind of like uh, it's hard to kind of like recruit um, punk punk guitarist in, into a country and western band, uh, so they need to have something in common. That was a that was a brilliant answer, and you did a great job, by the way, by answering <laughs> all the three questions that I asked. So kudos <laughs> on that front. Um, finally, um, you know, you've you've had uh, a lot of entrepreneurial success, uh, and you know you've explained your playbook. Uh, in some detail uh, on this podcast. My question to you is, how do you increase the odds of entrepreneurial success finding you? On one hand, you know, you mentioned you have passion and there are things that you put out in the world to create a dent in the universe, but how do you, like, how do you put yourself in a position where luck finds you, where this entrepreneurial su- success finds you? Is it about going for the fences, like swinging for the fences, going all out, or, or like, like what's your mantra in this front? I never have a plan B. Which so, translates to? To that when, when I come up to something, when I see something, I'm full in. Uh, okay. And, and I, I kind of like, uh, but I have no ego and I adjust all the time. So, so but as soon as you're starting to, to kind of like say, if this doesn't work, I'm going to do that. You have already failed. So, so, right. <clears throat> so having just kind of like, uh, one plan adjusting all the time and if somebody in the meetings tell you last what you just just said is just stupid and show me some mm-hmm. different data and I say wow you're right let's do the other thing so constantly kind of like navigating and and taking taking input and uh, and mm-hmm. not be afraid of say oh shit forget what i just told you that, that was stupid based on right the new data i just got from you guys let's do mm-hmm. this this is much smarter but so i i adjust my plan i at, at least kind of like five times every day but i never okay. have a plan b i know where i want to go 
how I get right. there, I'm not sure about. And uh, right. And I said, I said, there's no way to do 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 a safe startup. And I, uh, mm-hmm. I, I kind of like look on this as I don't know. Are you into base jumping, kind of like jumping off cliffs and stuff like that? Not really. I mean, perhaps <laughs> when the money comes in, I would have uh, <laughs> curated such interest. But for now, I'm happy staying on ground. But please go ahead. Okay. Really, now really, that really, really curious. Was a little bit back to do. You can't do a, do a, do a safe startup. But this is probably also to how you go kind of like parachuting, kind of like when you right. jump. You, when you jump, you jump. You jump, and yeah. then you just pray that the parachute opens up on time. Right? <laughs> yes. Uh, and, uh, okay. So that's uh, yeah. There, there's if if you yeah. So that's that's the startup life, and of course it's an emotional roller coasters of, mm-hmm. of um, ups and down and passion and. That's what I enjoy in life. You really feel alive, and of course, um, you um, and everything you do and uh, is self-inflicted pain. Uh, so it's 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 fantastic. I uh, I couldn't be more happy. That's uh, that's a great way to move on to to our final segment of the podcast. Uh, it's time for Frontier Fire, where I put my guests on the spot and ask uh-huh. them. A series of rapid fire questions. So, Lasse, are you ready? Yeah, you, you tricked me into this one, but I'm ready. I'm born ready. Perfect. I mean, you answer three questions in one shot. I mean, you're you definitely are ready. So let's <laughs> let's get started. Let's get started. Uh, what's your mantra in life, Lasse? Uh, happiness. Right. And what's the best advice you received? Uh, oh. Um if 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 you um, if you don't like your job, quit. Okay, despite not having a backup option, I just yes, life's too short. Okay, so we're all temporary immortal. Okay, that's a good way <laughs> to put it out. Um, a person who inspires you and why? It has been Scott McNeely uh, from from Sun Mic- uh, former company founder of the founder of, of Sun Microsystems. Of Sun right? Microsystem. uh, just just his. His style, his 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 attitude, and always betting on innovation, uh, of course, uh, and that's actually how you move things forward. And you you can't do everything right, but you're willing to try. I want to segue a bit from this uh, frontier fire section to to just ask you for some insight that has really stuck with you when it comes to working with the likes of Scott McNeely. Uh, I think it, again, it, it is the culture uh, how okay. you actually build something that, that people like to identify them and on, uh, identify them with being proud of, and and kind of feel you're doing something which is larger uh, larger than than yourself, and and this right. is of course uh, all innovation uh, is, is more or less kind of coming out of open source, uh, which is mm-hmm. a great thing because then you actually are part of something. You can actually create stuff that you couldn't do alone. So that right. that belonging uh, and creation and innovation and interaction it, it mm-hmm. was makes makes life interesting. So if you can get that culture uh, into your company, uh, right, a lot of things goes uh, really really well. Brilliant. Uh, okay, so back to back to the frontier fire. Uh, so you've spent time shuttling between Oslo and and the Bay Area. And uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on the contrast between the EU and the the United States um, software ecosystem per se. Uh, the EU, for instance, is not software centric traditionally. Could it be the hotspot for decentralized identity, though? I'm not sure. And mm-hmm. th- th- the thing is that things move so much faster in um, kind of like on the West Coast versus uh, okay. ca- kind of like in EU and. And again, people are are also failing faster, but they don't care. They kind of like you know, they just go up and and, and they try again. Uh, right. But of course, um, EU and and Europe has a little bit more kind of like a stigma. A st- step say. my step way of doing things, and of course yeah. that that also can work. On the other side, if if we go up a, kind of like uh, a couple of years back, uh, looking on the EU versus US, kind of like mm-hmm. uh, like. Nobody actually in in the U.S. even cared about privacy. Couldn't care less. Which of mm-hmm. course, 
uh, EU, and this has been uh, been kind of like something that's been part of our our generation for a long time, and one of one of our, our values, so to speak. Uh, Absolutely. But now th these are so you see a lot of in uh, kind of like. European culture, when it comes at this, from privacy, is absolutely also been been shipping and and things are started moving a lot. To, I would say the three last years in in the US mm -hmm. when it comes to this topic. Brilliant. And finally, Lasse, uh, what's your advice to anyone listening to this podcast? Don't do what I did. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I actually, I, I think it, it's the opposite. Uh, if if you have something that you're really passionate about, uh, apps, please go do it. You even if you fail, uh, if you don't do it, you will uh, regret uh, that that you didn't try. And and uh, if you can find some mentors that that can help you, that is fantastic. Just make sure that they kind of like still are kind of like yeah, hopefully are doing or still operating because things are moving so fast so mm -hmm. um, so yeah just make sure that you have talk to people that are still in the industry and still kind of like uh, running a company or doing something because then you get more fresh advice than people that that uh, kind of like have only been doing nothing for for a long time Right, so the moral of the story is uh, that we are all temporarily immortal and we all have to go out and chase our dreams irrespective of the outcome. That's uh, a beautiful way to, to end this podcast. Lasa, I just want to take this time again to thank you. It was an absolute honor speaking with you and uh, thank you for being really honest and open about uh, your experiences, uh, about your new venture, Indikite. And I wish you and your team the very best of luck as you go out and about to reshape the future of identity. Thank you so much, Lasse. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It really been a pleasure to talk to you. That was Lasse Andreessen. I hope you enjoyed this conversation that dabbled around the metaverse. We explored playbooks for successful venture building and also looked at how identity can go above and beyond just being a security paradigm. If cybersecurity is something that interests you, check out CSLS, the Cybersecurity Leadership Summit, where the conference explores topics like cyber leadership, resilience, disinformation, implications of non-human identities on society, and much more. It's going to be an amazing conference, and you can grab tickets via the link in the description box down below. I'd like to announce that this will be my final appearance on the Frontier Talk podcast and all I can say is that it's been an exhilarating ride. The Frontier Talk podcast would not have been possible without the love, support and feedback of you, our audience. And on behalf of the entire Kupinga Coal team, I'd like to personally thank you for joining me on this journey to redefine the I in identity. Thank you and goodbye.